This episode of Escape to the Quarter Bin is sponsored by Infinite Realities Comics and Games. Located in the heart of downtown Tucker, Georgia, with over 2,700 square feet of new comics, back issues, paperbacks and hardcovers, gaming, action figures, and of course, the quarter bins. You can even call ahead for curbside service. That's Infinite Realities Comics, Games, and more. Hey everybody, welcome back once again to Escape to the Quarter Bins. As always, I'm your host, Adrian Johnson. And today, like I said, I'm back in the bins, baby. And I think I got um, a few joints here that um, are, are, are going, to be, going to be some doozies. You know, I know I have at least one that's an all-time classic, one of my favorite issues. Every time I come across it in the bins, you know, I always try to snap it up. And I'm guaranteed to have one that you may not have thought, you know, well, wh why would he pick this up? You know, but... Um, this particular book contains one of my favorite artists, you know, and I think it's an artist that's underrated and that you may or may not have heard of. So let's get ready to get into it. But before we do, I just want to remind you guys that, you know, every time you like, share and subscribe here on the channel, it always helps out. And I do have a Patreon. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Inazuma Studios and for just one dollar a month. You can contribute to the channel and help keep this content coming out. So with that, let's move on. All right. So first up, here's the classic that I was talking about. All right. This is Action Comics Annual number one from 1987 by John Byrne, Arthur Adams and Dick Giordano. Now this this issue right here. Classic. Classic. I mean, just man, you know, obviously by um, Art Adams, Arthur Adams and uh, Giordano, which is just a pairing that you don't see it a lot. You know, I think this might have been their only pairing. And, you know, uh, Giordano's inking is noticeable even from the outset of this cover, because before this, you know, really, um, Adams had been inked by, you know, of course, um, Wills Protasio on the uh, long shot uh, miniseries. And then more notably, uh, he was inked by um, Terry Austin on like the uh, X-Men New, New Mutants um, annuals and crossovers. I think just maybe a couple years prior to this, back in 85, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I think um, to many fans and to my eye, you know, um, Adam's work was more um given towards like very line oriented inking you know what i mean like with kind of um small ticks or whatnot you know that um austin would put in there you know but to see someone like giordano you know put put his brush to it you know gave it a, a different look and feel you know as we'll see on the interior oh man look at this opening spread man that's man that's great you know, and, and the thing that, you know, amazes me about, you know, uh, Adams is how young he was to be so good as quickly as he was. You know, it seemed like if you, well, if you look at his earlier work, you can see that obviously he is, you know, just trying to, you know, um, get, get the tools in place. But it's like he quickly, quickly, you know, found his way. You know what I mean? Man, and, you know, all, all the hallmarks of, you know, Adams are there. You know, obviously, as on this uh, previous page, you see the attractive, the attractive girl, you know, he always had a penchant for that. And then these type of um, 3D um, shots, these 3D perspective shots, you know, where he would kind of be looking down, you know, at a scene, an establishing shot, you know, and everything would be in place. So thereafter... He really didn't have to do too much as far as background because he had already established it in their overhead um, uh, establishing shot. You know what I mean? And so if I recall correctly, um, this story is about um, Superman uh, who comes in. Well, no, not Superman. I'm sorry. It's about uh, Bruce Wayne who comes into who comes into town uh, disguised as, you know, this guy right here, you know, um, because he's investigating, uh, I think, these murders or something that was going on. And so obviously you have here, you know, um, 
he goes out at dusk, you know, to do his um, recon, his patrolling. And look at his shot here. Um, I think Adams had gone on record as saying that, you know, he was very much influenced by uh, Dark Knight Returns um, by Frank Miller, you know, and Miller's depiction of Batman, you know, in that, obviously in that, in that classic series. Um, so the way that he was drawing Batman here, you know, was influenced by that. You know, just a bit, a bit stockier, you know, than normal. But, you know, Adams really makes it his own. Like, that's totally, you know, Adams, his own um, depiction of um, Batman. You know, just classic. You know what I'm saying? Man. And I always love the way that Adams, you know, would you know draw the individual people, make them, you know, just stand out like their individual faces even though it's a crowd of people they all had their own personalities you know stuff like that you know adams just you know really that just really made his comics work you know just that much richer you know and again you know the same thing i was mentioning before about you know adam saying that he was influenced by uh dark knight returns you know just as you know miller you know would draw superman you know in his early appearances in that um series you know he would you know do superman in black because really if you have the uh, s shield and the red cape you know who it is you know and maybe uh maybe some of the uh, spit curl you know the spit s curl if you will but man i remember um getting this issue not this particular issue but another copy of it you know uh some time ago when i was um you know younger and just man I remember just reading this to death, man, you know, and, and I always loved annuals because, you know, they were, they were thick. They're like 48 pages, you know, obviously bigger than your standard issue, you know, double sized. So you just got more. So it was always sweet when you would get, you know, those annuals, especially by one of your favorite creators, uh, one of your favorite artists. It was like getting just a double helping, you know, if you will, of this stuff, man. Man, this man, this issue's so good. Oh. oh man. Classic, classic. Oh. Man. And and, and and Superman, he almost gets taken out here by the vampire because at this time, and I think, I think it's still the case, um, Superman was not impervious to you know, magic in the occult, you know, that was one of his weaknesses aside from a um, kryptonite that was established after his reboot, you know, I believe in uh, 86, 87 um, by John Byrne, obviously who wrote this issue. So he's keeping it consistent. And I just remember the end of this issue here is um, Batman obviously ends up taking out uh, this uh, female vampire, you know, but he also has to deal with the um the people that were infected you know you can definitely see here you know the, the stockiness um that adams was putting into his batman and superman just in that one shot that dark knight uh, returns influence but i remember that um they had to deal with like the people who were infected in that town and just uh batman was just kind of like yeah i'm gonna have to handle this <laughs> it's gonna be a long night all right next we got prime another annual prime annual number one and this is from malibu comics obviously it's from the ultraverse uh very nice uh boris vallejo cover painted cover you know and and it's funny i i, I think this may have been from layouts by uh, norm brafo it kind of has that um that m that overt muscularity you know um, obviously, you know, Boris is known for his depictions of muscularity, but also the exaggerated muscularity. I keep saying muscularity, like that word, um, that Bray Fogle, you know, exhibited here in the Prime series, you know. Let's see. Here we go. Yep. Uh, written by Lynn Strazewski and Gerard Jones and art by Norm Bray Fogle. And I think this is this is um one of his best issues to me, you know, if not his best, you know, of, of his prime stuff. 
And I'm still a fan of Prime. I, I think I may have featured Prime on a previous episode, uh, issue of that that I got. Um, but I came across this um, in the um, in the in the in the quarter bin, and I was like, you know, let me pick this up because I hadn't read this this one in a while. Man, you know, the thing that I loved about Bray Fogle, you know, and obviously rest in peace to late, you know, Norm Bray Fogle is just the way that he would do dynamic action in his figures. I mean, he was just a consummate, you know, storyteller and his work was so dynamic as well. You know, it's, it's the type of layouts that you, you wouldn't see anymore. Yeah, sorry, got a school bus passing here if you hear that backup light in the background um but yeah like these type of layouts you really don't see a lot you know anymore you know every, everything is just so oh man check that out huh man some cool stuff wow even stuff like that you know you don't really get a lot of that anymore you know at least these days i should say but yeah i always really dug brave fogel you know and you really see him once he um, made it over to Malibu and was doing the Ultraverse stuff. You know, I remember him saying on an interview that, you know, he felt like he was, you know, when he was doing Prime, you know, no pun intended, he felt that he was in the Prime, you know, of his life and his career. You know, um, he was getting paid very well, you know, off of this stuff. So he was really putting the best foot forward, you know, with this work, you know. And, uh, man, I, this stuff is really cool. All right, so now check out this section, okay? They had a sketchbook section in the middle here. So um, this is, I believe, a uh, design that um, Brayfogel did uh, of the new Prime costume. I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember how did, it, how did it differ from the previous one. Um, but I think because the previous one, you know, didn't have the blue in the pants here. Well, yeah, you know, I think this really shows um, Bray Fogel's skill as a uh, costume designer as well. Like he designed um, back in the early 90s, uh, he, re he redesigned the new Robin costume uh, that was uh, later ascribed, you know, to uh, Neil Adams. You know, um, they both had input on the uh, new costume that Tim Drake wore, you know, um, when they were rebooting uh, Robin in the early 90s. And then here's a poster of that front cover by Vallejo. So yeah, this one, this was this was just the this was just a good issue. Just this was just a good, good fun issue. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I still I still really enjoy this. And, and like I said, this is probably my favorite. Like <laughs> look at how ridiculous that musculature is, but if you can't be ridiculous in a comic book, where can you be ridiculous? You know, <laughs> this, this is just so, this is just really, really cool stuff. So, you know, he just really remains my, one of my favorites, man. It's a nice ending shot. All right, now next, we have a, uh, one of my favorite series um, ever, you know, from one of my favorite artists ever. And I don't know if I mentioned on a previous um, episode or in just elsewhere here on the channel that I'm a big, big military history buff, you know, uh, just when it comes to military history, uh, particularly um, anything dealing with um, the world wars um, and Vietnam, you know, that's that's right up my alley. So as such, you know, I've always been appreciator of um, military you know, books and comics and things like that. And with that, we have the NOM, issue number three by, I think it was written by Doug Murray and obviously art by the great Michael Golden. And this was a time, you know, that, um, you know, Golden, it really, his stuff really crystallized for me. You know, when I think of Michael Golden, I'm thinking of like this period, like that um, early to mid 80s period, you know, where his work really, really came to the fold. And, you know, one of his best anchors of the period is Armando Gill, you know, Armando Gill, especially in um, the nom number one, whew, 
great stuff. And in fact, even before that, let, let, let me correct myself there. Uh, before that, he had actually inked um, Golden on Avengers Annual number 10, the classic Avengers Annual number 10 with the Avengers fighting the uh, Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Oh, man. Great stuff. Great stuff. And, you know, Gil's inking, you know, really brought a dynamism and energy uh, to um, Golden's work, you know, during that period of time, you know. And, you know, the thing about Golden as well is you, you have to remember, when did this come out? I believe this was 86 or 87. OK, so February of 87. So during this time, you know, you have like a whole a whole spate of um, Vietnam movies coming out. You know, you had Platoon in 86, um, October of 86. Um, and then that was followed by Hamburger Hill and just a whole litany of Vietnam movies. So, you know, Vietnam, you know, was very prevalent, you know, around this time. And I believe that's what made the um, made this um, book, this um, series so popular early on. Like it was a runaway hit, apparently, you know, when it first came out. And that's doing no, no small part to um, Golden's work. I mean, the stuff that he was doing here. You know, look at the detail as far as on this um, on the military equipment and the um, and, and the and the uniforms, you know. You know, and it's not just detail for its own sake. Look how he sets up, you know, downtown. I believe this is downtown Saigon. Uh, these three guys are on R&R, &R, you know, here in Saigon. He just talks about what happens when they go on leave, you know. The uh, young soldier here, um, Ed Marks, the young guy here, um, yeah, right here, you know, he's, you know, he's kind of like a, <laughs> he's kind of like a Johnny Appleseed, a Johnny Hayseed, I should say, you know, he, he's he been in the now, but he's still kind of a rookie, kind of a, kind of a greenie, you know what I'm saying? Even though he's been out in the field, so he's going with these two more experienced guys to see what, what, what life is like, you know, when you go on leave for a few days before returning back um, to the battlefront. Man, that's cool. Now, now, I've wondered about this part here, you know. Um, I've wondered if maybe someone else retouched this because this doesn't quite look like um, the rest of Golden stuff, even when um, Gil is inking him. So I wonder if somebody might have did this particular panel right here or some of this other stuff, you know what I mean? Um, and, and to be fair, I believe Golden was doing just layouts. Okay, so he was a penciler. But I think within a couple issues after this, maybe around issue issues five or six, uh, he was just starting starting to do layouts and the, it would be up to the anchor to finish it. And I believe by that time, Gil was off the series and uh, he was being inked by John Beatty, who was taking the layouts and um, inking them himself and adding more of that, you know. Ooh, va va voom. Meeting the, meeting the young ladies there. All right. And I'm convinced that um, Golden probably also did the color guides for it because it has the telltale signs of like some of Golden's um, coloring when he would do his own stuff. Like Golden always chose these very hot colors, but he would always juxtapose them with something cool, you know, with a cool color, you know, and it would kind of, you know, meet here. You know, you can see that on a lot of his later cover work where he was doing the color guides for himself. You know, and you could always tell when it was him. He would choose like, you know, big fields of a hot color, but then have a cool color within it to kind of contrast it. And it always works for, for his thing. That was his, you know, formula, so to speak, you know. But yeah, if you've never read the NOM, I highly recommend it. Definitely recommend it. It's absolutely one of the best um, comic book series that you'll find, you know, detailing uh, the Vietnam War. Although, albeit in a fictionalized sense, but it's very good. And um, I would suggest that you also start with, um, track down uh, Savage Tales, I believe it's one and two. Um, it has, uh, it's magazine size, to Marvel uh, magazine size. And um, it has um, Murray and Golden's first um, collaboration together, a Vietnam story called Fifth to the first that's a precursor to the knob 
and it's in black and white. Oh, it's fantastic. It's gorgeous. You can tell that Golden took a while on it, um, but you know, it's definitely worth it. So track that down as well. And track this down also. Um, I believe Golden did issues one through about 11 or 12 of the um, of the NOM before he before he was off of it. And the NOM is also available in a magazine format, just like those um, Savage Tales I was telling you about. Um, track those down because you can get those first 12 issues in black and white also, you know, um, at a larger size. So you can really see that great um, Golden and Gill artwork. So. So yeah, man, the nom, number three. All right, all right, so winding it down, we have Rune, number one, by Barry Windsor Smith. I think it's both written and drawn by uh, Windsor Smith, if I'm not mistaken. And this is from, let's see, 1994. And it's a part of the Ultraverse, so we got another Ultraverse um, comic from Malibu here um, in the episode. And let's see. Hmm. Okay, so written by Barry Windsor Smith and Chris Ohm. Ah, I forgot Ohm, you know, was helping to write this. But drawn by Windsor Smith, inked by Alex Bialy and John Floyd. Two names that you would see on a lot of um, Windsor Smith comics um, starting in the, I want to say, the very late 80s. Definitely by the 90s, you know, you would see them all the time working on, you know, um, Windsor Smith stuff, you know what I'm saying, as assistants, you know, and helping to ink as well. But yeah, Windsor Smith, his work is so classic, obviously, you know, like he's one of those to where it's almost as if a friend recently was talking about um, Windsor Smith. He said, you know, his stuff is almost as if you had somebody like a <laughs> like a Leonardo da Vinci or some type of uh, obviously a pre-Raphaelite, you know, drawing comics because it just has that that very florid line, almost like neoclassical almost. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, it's almost as if, you know, those type of illustrators, you know, were doing comics work. You know, because everything is just it's just so flowing, you know, and um Room is about an energy vampire, if I recall correctly. And um, Rune obviously are are stones, and these stones around his neck are the runes. So he's trying to, I believe, collect them or something like that. You know, I'm still trying to collect the whole series after all these years myself. You know, so I can finally figure out what's going on. Um, in my collection, though, I have like obviously this number one as well as um, a couple of other issues, but I'm still trying to piece together the rest of the story. Um, but I'll tell you what's a great one that, um, that uh, Windsor Smith also drew, you know, around this time. He drew a Rune versus Conan crossover, if you can believe that. And it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. You know, really the only thing that kind of, um, not ruins it, but is a detraction for me, is some of this 90s coloring, you know, does him no favors. You know, I'm one of those, like, you know, Windsor Smith works, you know, best to me when he's in black and white or um, when he's colored, when he's coloring his work for newsprint, you know, um, like stuff like, you know, that you see on like the old Weapon X, you know, issues, the original issues for Marvel Comics Presents. Like that stuff just just works like his stuff really works well on newsprint or or oh my one of my favorites um x uncanny x-men uh 205 where he's fighting the reavers and lady Deathstrike. oh that's a good one too on newsprint uh and that's all coming back to me oh or, or how about iron man 232 that's a good one too so he was really hitting his stride you know um or oh man <laughs> or what about machine man you know that limited series uh, one through four just check out any of those, you know, for some great, you know, Windsor Smith stuff. You know what I'm saying? Just, oh man, he was really hitting his stride then. But this Rune stuff is is good. I think this, um, I think Rune is very underrated as far as um, his work goes during this period. You know, and I really, I really want to check out, you know, more of that stuff, you know. Um, that Rune Conan, like I said, is excellent, but I want to actually read the main story so I can get a sense of, 
you know what's really going on here because this is this is good stuff man it's a great shot mm. all right and then lastly last but not least and we have one that i mentioned at the top of the episode maybe um an artist that some of you may be unfamiliar with you know but he's definitely one of my favorites you know even after i first saw his stuff you know way back when um in the early 2000s when he was i'm um, starting to do some stuff with marvel and that is the book that he's featured in today is the call of duty the wagon and the artist in question is i believe is Danigel, and i've always been at a loss as to pronounce his last name i think it's zelje and i'm probably butchering that i apologize Danigel. um but if someone wants to phonetically give me, you know, um, the explanation as to how to properly pronounce that, please do in the uh, in the comment sections below. Um, but yeah, this stuff here, and this is him on the cover as well. And and I'll be calling him Danigel since I don't want to, you know, um, mispronounce his last name further. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and this is written by uh, Chuck Austin, art by uh, Danigel. And this came out in January of 2003. So what happened was, was that, you know, during this time, this is obviously, unfortunately, very fresh off of the 9-11 um, attacks, you know, on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon and that whole period. So if many of you recall, you know, during this time, um, there was a, a, a lot of, um, I hate to say fervor, but there was a, um, a, a big movement to uh, celebrate the contributions of first responders, uh, police officers, and firemen, because obviously they were, you know, the first ones, you know, to be there on ground zero and in the ensuing days thereafter, you know, just helping to um, maintain order. And so thus you had Marvel come out with a series of books called Call of Duty, and they were, you know, dedicated to each of those branches of service. So you had a wagon, which was dedicated to, you know, EMTs and first responders. You had another book uh, for police. And then there was another book for, <clears throat> for the firemen, you know, and I think they're all represented in here as well. Like all the characters of those call of duty books actually cross over in between the books. So you get a taste, you know, of the characters from each, you know, and the thing that, strikes me about um, Danigel's work here is that it's obviously the blacks, obviously, you know, the spotted blacks. And he very much reminds me when you look at him and when I've, when I've seen his other work as well, prior to this, it's almost like a, a Richard Corbin, you know, if you will, you know, just by, you know, the way he does perspectives on his characters, you know, kind of the, um, the, the height ratio of a lot of his characters too. It's very Corbin-esque, you know. Man, um, other books that, like, where I, where I first found um, Danigel was actually on a book that, um, when he first started doing some work for Marvel, and he had actually been in the industry, the American comics industry, for quite a while. Um, but I first found him on, um, on Marvel, I mean, he was doing a um, miniseries called Captain America, uh, Dead Man Running. Um, that stuff was that stuff was very good. It was very different, you know. And, and at the time, I was looking for just something different because you know we're coming out of you know, the whole image mold, and I was just you know, I was just really looking for something at the time, you know, just just different than what I was reading, you know. And um, he absolutely fit the bill. So yeah, so if you get a chance, make sure to check him out. I would recommend, um, you know, his Marvel stuff. On, oh, that's a great shot. Man, look at the perspective on that. I would recommend um, Dead Man Running, uh, Captain America, Dead Man Running. Um, this, you know, I would recommend it only if, you know, as a collector of, of Danigel's stuff. You know, the story from what I've read is like, eh, eh. I can really, really take or leave it, but, but the artwork is good, you know, and, um, he has several other books in his bibliography that are good. Um, 
I would also recommend an earlier um, an earlier book by him called Rex. Um, it's a graphic novel that he did. Um, I believe it was released um, there in Europe. And um, I've seen a copy over here. Um, and I regret that I didn't pick it up. But I've read um, a lot of it online as well. Um, that's very good also. I got to get a copy of that, you know, um, eventually. But uh, I really enjoy his stuff a lot, a lot. In fact, I need to check back in the bin and see if they have uh, more of these, you know, just, just to get just this artwork. Because this stuff is good. Very good. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, guys, that's all I got for you this go around. Thank you, as always, for coming back to Escape to the Quarter Bins. We're out. Peace.